Hey everybody, welcome to my basic Dungeons and Dragons character creation video that we did last Saturday night creating our new characters for my new basic Dungeons and Dragons game. I didn't want to show you the whole multi-hour video of us doing the roles and all that stuff and you know all of the banter back and forth. I just wanted to make a, a short video kind of explaining each character that was created. So we're going to be playing this game every other Saturday night. And our first session is going to be Saturday, the 22nd of June. And we will be playing every two weeks, uh, every other week, basically. And it's going to be at 8 p.m. Mountain Time on my Twitch channel. And the Twitch channel is down below in the comment section. So I've already talked about how I'm going to run my Dungeons and Dragons games. You can watch that video. Uh, you know, it was uploaded a couple of days ago. But this is just solely character creation. And I'm going to go over each character. So we're going to run five characters in this group. Uh, I think five characters is going to be enough. We're not going to have the need to do any kind of henchman or anything like that. Uh, maybe down the line uh, we'll incorporate. Maybe I'll play an NPC uh, to bring the party up to six if they're if they're having any kind of trouble or anything like that. But I think I think five people will be enough without henchmen. Usually all of the you know the B and X modules uh, for now is what I'm going to be running. They're usually always engineered between four and four and six players maybe seven players but uh, but i'll play it by ear and if i need to add another character i'll probably just play an npc that that won't have any uh involvement probably be some type of a like a mute or something like that so uh, i can't give away any kind of lore for the game i think that would be fun so we're gonna we're gonna dive right into it and uh the first player uh, is one of my newer players uh rachel uh, very nice, and she played in my Water Deep Dragon Heist game that uh, we are no longer playing. Uh, so she's one of the newer players, along with Johnny, and uh, Johnny is uh, Lance's son, which is Pernicious Pilfer, and Rachel is Lance's girlfriend. So I've got like a trio, which is really nice. Uh, so, like I said, uh, you know, Rachel, she, unfortunately, she had the worst roles because we basically went straight on down the line 3d6 strength intelligence wisdom dexterity calling charisma i mean as you can see with the the paper there i mean she rolled four eights a nine and a 13 that is pretty brutal so she rolled a 13 con which is good at least she wouldn't have had any negative hit points but i give the players the option at the end of rolling their six ability scores i gave them the option to flip flop one or they could re-roll and if they didn't get uh didn't get a minimum of eight i gave them an eight so that was another thing because i don't think it's i don't think it's going to be fun to have a three strength or a three intelligence sure it would be fun and entertaining to you know watch that as a viewer someone that is just drooling all over themselves of course i'm having fun with that but so i at least let the the players have with a 3d6 roll at least a minimum of an eight I think maybe in the future I might go with a negative, uh, uh, just with a ten. I mean that. I mean it's not game breaking. There's no bonus or anything like that. But an eight will you will yield a, a negative one bonus. Uh, but her, she definitely had the worst rolls uh, by far of everyone. I mean she even rolled. She only rolled sixty gold as well. Uh, so. She didn't have the luck of the Irish on her side and didn't have RNG uh, in her corner. But that's okay because uh, she chose to flip-flop her con and strength. So she's playing a dwarf and her dwarf's name is Batilda the Dwarf, which is a great name. I love it. It's such a, a basic D&D-ish name. So she flip-flopped con to strength. So now she's going to have a 13 strength and an eight con. So she's going to get a negative one hit point per level, uh, but she's going to get a 5% experience point bonus. And in basic Dungeons and Dragons, if you have a 13, 14, or 15 primary attribute, then you get a 5% experience bonus. If you have a 16, 17, or 18, 
uh, it's a 10% experience bonus. And like I explained in my uh, previous video about how I'm running the games, not only in basic D&D &D do you get uh, experience for killing monsters, but you also get experience for uh, gold. So you get one experience point for every gold that you get. Or if you sell items, you get experience for that. If you keep magic items, I'm not going to award experience for that. But if you but if the party sells experience, uh, sells magic items, I'll give that gold piece value uh, for experience, and we'll split it up in the party. So, but if you know, but then again, if you know Lance playing the thief, if he goes ahead and maybe does some sneaky sneaky stuff he'll get he'll get bonus experience and lance gets 10 percent. so that's even that's even better yet for him so she's got a 13 strength and eight intelligence nine wisdom eight decks which is going to get minus one to ac as well and uh the eight con minus one hit point and she's got an eight charisma so hey there's going to be ways to raise your ability scores. I mean, there's, you know, whether it be by magic items or maybe some type of uh, blessing or, or or maybe some type of uh, reward or something down the line. Uh, but I do want to reward the players, you know, with uh, raising their ability scores. And uh, but I, I think she'll have fun with it. And uh, yeah, dwarf. She's playing a dwarf. And you know the dwarf is like a fighter, so the, the the dwarf will eventually, about level twelve or so, will get the 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 options that the fighter gets at level nine. So like smash and parry and disarm and stuff. So that would come later for the dwarf, but from the beginning, the dwarf can use a lance. So if you know the dwarf ever decides to do lance attacks, or if uh, the dwarf ever decides to do set spear versus charge, so if you have a thousand orcs charging towards you, you can at least put a spear down and set spear versus charge. So uh, you know, but the dwarf being a demi-human, the dwarf is automatically right off the bat going to get much better uh, saving throws compared to the other classes. So take, for instance, the dwarf is going to get death ray or poison, only needs to roll an eight. That's a hell of a good bonus because most classes that are non, you know, non uh, hybrids or the demi humans, they have like a 12, 13 plus. So, you know, even though it does take a lot longer to gain levels with a dwarf and any other demi human class like an elf or or a halfling, uh, the dwarf and the other demi humans, they get much better saving throws. Uh, so, death ray poison eight at level one, magic wands nine, paralysis and turn to stone is ten, and then dragon breath is thirteen, and any kind of rod, staff, or spell is a twelve. That's great. So she's already ahead of the curve, even with her lower ability score. She's she's still going to have great saving throws. So the way that we're doing the optional death uh, saving throws from the rule cyclopedia, I believe, to page two twenty six. If the player gets to zero, normally they die. There's no negative hit points. There's no saving throws every round for success and failure like in other editions. In basic D&D, if you get to zero. But at least we're going to do the optional rule to, if you hit zero, then you do the death ray versus, uh, you know, a saving throw. So she's only going to need to roll an eight or higher, which is pretty good. She's got a 60% chance of success for lasting another round. So she's going to bleed out and every round until someone can get to her. But if she fails the saving throw, then she dies. So that, that, but great saving throws for a dwarf. You know, also later on, the dwarf will get, you know, special defenses where any kind of spell will start doing half damage. Uh, that's that's pretty nice. Dwarves also get infrared, uh, infra vision, to where they can see sixty feet out, hot and cold. So if it's undead, they'll be able to see like a cold, blurry image, and if it's uh, within ten feet, they can actually see it a lot better. So it's not like it's in other editions to where it's like ah, you just see what you can see within sixty feet. No, it's like blurs, and any kind of heat would be like a like a red blur. 
which is which is pretty cool. And magic items with any kind of like magic properties would would probably turn up a, as a red as well. So they get Infravision, and then they get a ton of languages. Not only do they get to speak common and dwarvish, they also get to speak gnome, goblin, and kobold. So that is going to be vital, especially at the lower levels for communication. So the dwarf gets a ton of languages right off the bat. And then the last thing that the dwarves get is called the detection skill. Oh, well, the, the detection, you know, basically class feature. And what this does is, you know, dwarves are stonemasons. So if they're in any kind of dungeon or castle or anything like that that's made of stone, they can detect traps. And it's on a uh, D6. And if they roll a one or a two, I believe it's a one or a two, it would be successful. And they find the, you know, the, the column that's going to come out and smash them. It doesn't mean that they can, it, you know, this isn't like rogues to where they can just detect any kind of trap. This has to be like a stone type of trap. So nothing in the forest, maybe in the runes or something. If there's some types, some, some type of runes that are made out of stone or something, then yes, they could probably detect traps there. But the dwarf is actually a really nice class to start with. And, you know, I'm glad that she did switch her con and strength round. So she's at least going to get a plus one to hit and damage. So her Thacko will probably, uh, it'll be a little bit better. It'll be one. I believe the dwarves have a Thacko of 19 uh, to start with. But I, I, I believe every, I believe every class gets a 19. I mean, don't, don't hundred percent take me by that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember so much information. Uh, but I believe everybody has a 19. It's either 19 or 18. So, she, but everything's not going to be armor class zero at level one either. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, AC six and seven stuff. So they're, they're going to have to roll in the low teens probably to uh, get successful hits, just like every other D&D game. It's just translated a little differently through Thacko. So, yeah, the dwarf is a really cool class. I, I like the dwarf. I played a dwarf for a little while until he died. Uh, I actually think I, I tried to smash open a door and I, I died. So, But that's another thing with strength, too. You know, she's going to get a uh, plus one bonus to opening doors because you smash doors in D&D, too, with a D6. So the lower you roll, the better it is. And uh, Well, no, I believe it's five and six to open a door. But if you got a plus one strength, then it would be like a four, five, six. It could be the opposite, a one or two and one, two, three. So, you know, uh, but I'll have to I'll just have to, to look at my cheat sheet later on. But, you know, next we're I'll talk about the weapon mastery is the uh, optional weapon masteries that came from the box set for the black box or the mastery box set that introduced weapon masteries. And we are also going to go with the weapon mastery uh, system to kind of, you know, enhance our characters a little bit and give us a little bit more options instead of just swinging your boring hand axe or the battle axe that she took the masteries in. So every class except for the fighter, gets two weapon masteries. And you can see that every single player took their two weapon masteries. Now, if you were playing a fighter, the fighter would get four weapon masteries. And then every four levels or so, I think at level five and then level nine, you'll get another, no, I think that's skill checks. But every couple levels, you'll get another weapon mastery. And of course, the fighter will get them a little bit quicker. But now that she has hand axe and battle axe, she is a she's basically skilled. She's a basic skill with a level one. But every time you get another weapon mastery point, they're going to have to train. So uh, it will cost at least a minimum of a hundred gold to train. And we are we are doing training. I mean, there's no we're not going to do the you know the sixty percent success chance or anything like that. I think paying a hundred gold is fair enough to get training. And when you train, when you get another weapon mastery, you can either upgrade one of your, you know, if she decides to raise battle battle master, you know, well, the, the battle axe from level one to level two training, then her battle axe will get some type of perk. So maybe the battle axe will go to, uh, you know, 1d8 plus two instead of just being 1d8. So, but of course, she'll still get to add in her 13 strength, uh, which is a plus one modifier. So the higher you raise up your weapon masteries, the higher damage you're going to do. 
And also it could add in other things like maybe a bleed or maybe knocking a uh, target prone or maybe disarming them or breaking their weapon, maybe giving you an armor class bonus as well. So the weapon uh, mastery system is a really nice optional system to incorporate into your basic D&D game. And uh, we're doing that. But she's a, she's proficient in hand axe and battle axe. Typical dwarf, you know what I mean? Next, uh, you'll see that uh, we have some skills. And the skill system is also optional. It is in the rule cyclopedia. And the basically, the weapon mastery is on page 15 if you have the black box. And if you have the rule cyclopedia, uh, the weapon mastery and skill check system is on page 75 and 81. So every character starts with four skills of their choice, and they're all based off of your ability scores. So, you know, hunting is intelligence based. Uh, healing is based off of a, uh, I believe it's wisdom. Intimidation is based off of charisma, I believe. And, you know, how you roll a skill check in basic Dungeons and Dragons is you take your ability score. So if she's if she's going to be hunting, which hunting is uh, you can only hunt with like a spear or a bow or some missile type of weapon, which she doesn't have. So she's she's not going to be able to hunt, but she can still forge for food because hunting also allows you to forge as well. So. The way that skill checks work in basic D&D is you take the ability score and you either roll that number or less. So it's not like getting a 20. Oh, yeah, I got a 20. I got a critical success. If you get a 20, that's an automatic fail. But if you get a 1, that's a, a true success. So that's how the skill checks work. It's based off of the, the ability score that's tied to that. I like the system. And every four levels, so at level five, level nine, et cetera, you'll get another skill upgrade. Of course, you're going to have to pay to train that as well. And you can either get a plus one in that skill. You know, uh, maybe, you know, take for instance, she's going to try to hunt. You know, she's got a pretty bad ability score, so she's going to have to roll an eight or lower. But if she puts another plus one into that, then it would be nine or lower. So it's a little bit 5% better chance to, to be successful. But rolling skill checks, one is always a success, and a 20 is always a fail. So that's that's how the skill checks work. She's taken, you know, hunting allows you to, as long as the creature doesn't know you'll, you're you there, you'll get like a plus one to hit as well. Uh, and also with hunting, you can forge. And you can also, I believe you can also hunt and forge for more food than one person. So if you do that, it's like minus one. So if you want to hunt or forge for three people, it would be like a minus two to your roll. So yeah, it just, it, but it makes sense. You know what I mean? She got healing. So basically healing allows you to do a couple of things. Healing allows you to do a 1d3 heal on someone uh, with their current wounds if you have a successful healing check. And I believe healing is based off of, of uh, wisdom. Let me, uh, I'm going to check really quick. So uh, let's see, 70, let's see, 81. Healing is based off of intelligence. So her intelligence is eight. So she's going to have to, if she's going to try to heal someone, you can only attempt at one time. So she's going to have to roll an eight or lower to be successful. But then again, she can always raise it later on. So that, you know, healing will allow you to ascertain what type of maybe a disease or injury you have, if it's maybe internal. And then it'll also allow you to heal 1d3 which would basically be a one on a one and two six sided two hit points for a three or four and three for a five or six. So that's the healing skill. Uh, also fire building. Fire building is actually pretty cool. I mean, it, uh, I, and I'm glad somebody took this. This is really cool. It, it allows you to basically light a fire in normal conditions with a tinder box. You don't, you know, but I mean, you can, keep rolling and rolling and rolling anyway. But what fire building is going to do is it's not going to be as bad trying to light a fire and like uh, 
conditions of like rain or cold or something like that. So fire building will actually kind of help you out on that, which is good. But she's going to need a tender box and she doesn't have one. <laughs> and I'll talk about the equipment later on. And last but not least, uh, intimidation. Uh, intimidation is based off of, I believe it is strength. Yes, it is strength. So she'll get a you know a plus one to roll. So she'll she'll uh, have to roll a uh, like a uh, uh, yeah thirteen or lower for her uh, intimidation checks. But there's some stipulations with intimidation too. It's really good at the lower levels, but once you start getting a little bit higher, it's going to be a little bit harder to intimidate someone like level five or lower if it's if it's an NPC. But if you're level 10 and the king's like level one and he has this like elite court of guards around him or something like that, and it gives it as an example in the book, then yeah, basically uh, you wouldn't be able to intimidate. But it's all up to the DM as well. So I, I will take that kind of stuff into consideration. So she rolled 3d6 times 10. She rolled 60 gold. She rolled a six, so she gets 60 gold. And as you can see on this list, it seems like plate mail was the priority for everyone to get that uh, to get that higher armor class. Uh, but then again, you know, she bought plate mail, which is 60 gold. So I don't know how she got the money for the shield, the hand axe, and the water skin. So uh, I am going to have to reach out uh, to her. And but Matilda the Dwarf, Fenrin the Thief, and Klutz the Thief know each other. I don't know. Maybe they all knew each other and maybe they pulled their gold together. I don't know. I'm going to have to find out. In fact, I, I sent a, a message uh, earlier, but we'll find out. Maybe there will have to be some adjusting, but no rations. I, I don't see any rations. Uh, I don't see any other tinderbox for the fire building skill that she has. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. So, um, but that's Matilda the Dwarf, level one dwarf. So next we have Rob Tui. Rob uh, Tui is a, a friend of mine. I've known him for a couple of years now. He's also a streamer. Uh, he's got his, his own Rob Tui channel. And you can check him out on, on YouTube and stuff. And this is the first time he's going to be in one of my games. So I'm really excited about it. And Rob didn't roll too well either. His highest score is a 10. Uh, and he decided to go with a demi-human as well. He decided to go with the halfling. And he rolled a uh, an 8 strength. He rolled an 8 intelligence, 8 wisdom, an 8 dex, a 10 con, and a 10 charisma. Now, what he did was he decided to re-roll one of his rolls with the uh, optional roll that we had after after all the rolls. And he rolled a 10. And that was a good move. And he up he upgraded his dex from an 8 to a 10. So at least he doesn't get a negative modifier on his dex now. So uh, no need to talk about any of the the you know the ability scores. We've already done that. Uh, but his uh, halfling is level one, and <laughs> the name of his halfling is Half Court. I like that. That's a that's a cool D and D name as well. So he has decided to go with short sword and light crossbow weapon mastery, and that's going to add, like I said, with with Rachel, it's only going to add more damage and more things that the crossbow and short sword can do later on. So that's really cool. So as for skills. Rob took his four skills were uh, blind shooting and blind shooting basically gets rid of the negative modifier on anything that you can't see when you're trying to shoot it. So that's a, that's a nice, it seems like he's going to go heavy into light crossbow with weapon mastery and skills. So I, I like that. That's a, that's definitely a good choice. Uh, escape. I like this as well because escape is dex based, I believe. And this is where if you're, you know, tied up or cuffed or chained or anything like that, you can escape with a successful uh, roll. He's also got endurance, which endurance allows you to do vigorous activities for an hour, like a like a uh, super forced march or uh, running for an hour straight. And you can continue to do that. The first hour is free, but then after that, every additional hour after that, you have to do a uh, basically a constitution check 
to make sure that you can continue to do this. And then once you fail, you have to rest for like three times the normal period. So uh, it's definitely something that you can take a chance doing, but when you fail, you're basically out of commission for a while. And then you took bargaining, which I'm really happy uh, that somebody took bargaining. And bargaining is going to really help with getting experience points, which Rob doesn't get a bonus for experience points. So because you have to have a basically a 13 in your primary attributes to get an experience bonus for the halfling. And unfortunately, he uh, he doesn't get a bonus. But the bargaining can actually act as a bonus for him and the rest of the group because, you know, if he's trying to sell some magic items and maybe, you know, the quirky NPC is trying to, you know, lowball him, he could use his bargaining skill to get a little bit more. So that's how bargaining is used. And I like that. You know, it's some other stuff with the halfling. It's a, it's a, it's a, a, a demi human class. So the halfling, you know, Rob's going to get great saving throws, pretty much just like the dwarf. So death ray and poison is going to be an eight. Magic wands is going to be a nine. Paralysis and turn to stone is a 10. Uh, breath attack is a 13. And rod staffs and spells are 12. So the halfling definitely gets really nice saving throws but as you know being a demi human it's going to take more experience compared to like the rogue getting you know a level at you know 1200 xp at level two it's going to take rob 2000 experience so you're going to see a fluctuation in levels all across the board it's not like milestone ding everybody's level two it's not it doesn't work like that in basic D D. so Every class has different uh, amounts of experience that they need. So the uh, the halfling, they also are going to get the, you know, the, they will get set spear versus charge and uh, lance attacks. Uh, uh, well, no, they won't get lance attacks because they're too small, but they can still set spear versus charge. So they'll get that at level one. Uh, they'll also get a, a, a bonus to armor later on uh, because of them being so small and then they'll also get uh, a little bit better uh, damage negations on dragon breath as well and they only go to level eight but there's some you know there's also some options to where it's like 180,000 experience uh, per level after that and you know uh, we'll definitely incorporate that as well uh, they're also going to get some woodland abilities, which is going to be able to let them spot and, you know, hide in the shadows and in the underbrush and stuff like that. And, you know, they have a high percentage chance of that. I think it's like 80, 90 percent. So, yeah, that's pretty nice. And then I've already talked about the special defenses. So they'll they basically take like half damage later on, which is really nice. So that's the halfling. And uh, for equipment, Rob actually had 110 gold, which is actually a pretty good roll. And he he spent basically, I think he spent every single gold. And he uh, he bought plate mail, light crossbow, short sword, matches his uh, skills and everything. He's got a water skin, boots, quiver, and uh, a quarrel of bolts. So no food again. But... You know, everybody wants that high armor class, you know, well, that low armor class because plate mail costs 60 gold. So, you know, that it, it seems like that is what the theme is. But if it was me, I would, you know, as you can see, Brother Claudius, which is played by Andrew, Claudius has a lot more stuff going on with equipment. But then again, he rolled the highest at 130 gold. So, but there's going to be plenty of gold. The players are going to have lots of opportunities to buy more stuff, you know, but they're going to have to spend a lot of gold too with training and new spells and stuff like that. So yeah, that's going to be, that's going to be really cool. So that's, uh, that's Rob's character. He's a level one halfling named half court. <laughs> kind of like, uh, half pint would have been cool too. So next we've got Johnny. He's the youngest of the group. He's 13 years old and he's the son of Lance, which is pernicious pilfer. And he rolled pretty decent. Uh, he rolled a 12 strength 
a 13 intelligence, an 8 wisdom, 16 dex, an 8, and an 8. And he was able to create a elf, which the elf has a couple of minimum requirements of strength and intelligence. But he doesn't have a 13 in both. So he does not get an experience point bonus and he's off by one point <laughs> so but he's playing an elf an elf is like a it's a another demi human and they get to attack with a sword you know so they'll get the fighter stuff and they also get magic they get spells they get magic user spells but they don't get the amount of spells that the normal you know magic user would get so you know, it, they, they get like maybe a third of the amount of spells, which is, uh, yeah, not too, he gets one spell at level one, which is not too bad. But, you know, he's got to be a couple of levels, and, and the elf takes a lot of experience level because it's sort of like a multi-class. So the elf takes 4,000 experience to get to level two. 4,000. The halfling took 2,000. And then the rogue is like 1,200 or whatever it is. But the elf can go up to 10. Uh, but after that, you you can still level up at, I believe, about 250,000 per level. So the elf, powerful as it is, that's why it takes uh, a little bit more. Because both fighting abilities and also magic. So, yeah, pretty, pretty neat. No experience point bonus, though. So, you know, armor and weapons, the elves can pretty much use just about everything. And uh, as for the elf, the elf will also get a, a bunch of fighter options once they hit a little bit level, a uh, little bit higher level at the 850,000 mark. They'll be able to start using smash and stuff like that, much like the dwarf and then the fighter. But the, the demi humans, instead of nine like the fighter, they get to start using that stuff at around level 12. So that, but they will, you know, but the elf will get the fighter combat options. Special defenses as well, uh, just like the other, you know, classes of the, uh, the you know, the hybrids, the demi humans. They get, you know, more resistance to dragon breath, basically. Uh, also, the elves get infravision, uh, infra same type of 60 foot, identical to the dwarves. Uh, they get uh, languages, they get common, and they also get, el well, besides elf, they get gnoll, hobgoblin, and orc. So they've got so many languages covered just between the dwarf, you know, and also uh, uh, the dwarf, well, the dwarf and the elf. So. But the humans, any kind of human class, they'll also they'll also get uh, bonus languages depending on their intelligence. Uh, now, they'll also get uh, detection, so the elves can find secret and hidden doors better than other characters. And you know, basically, I'll figure it out and I'll do some type of hidden role to where. I'm not going to just say, hey, give me a detection roll. And then when I give that signal, everybody's like rolling now. Oh, I want to do it too. So I'm going to figure out something to do with detection. I'll probably do it like a, like a sort of like a passive perception or something like that. Uh, but it's never automatic. But there will be a chance that, you know, the, the elf will have a pretty good chance to find something. So if, if Lance playing the sea, thief doesn't find anything, maybe, you know, maybe Johnny will as the elf. So here's another nice uh, another nice feature that the elf gets, and it's immunity to ghoul paralysis. Uh, basically, the elves are naturally immune to the paralyzation of uh, attacks of ghouls and other paralysis attacks like carrying crawlers and gelatinous cubes and stuff won't affect them. So that's that's really nice. And then last but not least, you know, being a hybrid class, they get magic user spells, and they don't get very many of them. I mean, at the high levels, they're only going to get like three first level, three second level, three third, fourth, and they can only cast fifth level spells. So it's not like an elf can cast ninth level spells like a regular magic user, simply because, you know, they're a hybrid, basically. Now, as for a uh, two-handed sword and a longbow for Johnny, so that's what he's going with weapon mastery. 
And for skills, he's going hunting and healing. We've already talked about those two. No need to, to do that. But you'll notice that Johnny has five skills and everybody else has four. And that's because Johnny has a bonus, uh, an intelligence bonus of plus one. So any kind of intelligence bonus gives you an extra skill when you create your character. So he has taken uh, an extra one. So he's got acrobatics, that's dexterity base, that allows you to do tumbles, jump across roofs and stuff like that, really cool stuff. He also took alchemy, which will let you identify potions, herbs, etc. Oh, excuse me, man. Got to stop drinking soda. And then alchemy also has an option to where if it's up to the DM, they can create antidotes as well. And I'll probably incorporate that because an antidote will be nice to have when it comes time to saving throw versus poison or die. And that's how it works in basic D&D. So alchemy, good choice for Johnny. Uh, that's intelligence based, I believe. So, and then we'll, we'll come up with some perfect medium on using alchemy to find herbs and maybe make an antidote every once in a while. So I think that, I think that's fair, you know, and then he took craft and all kinds of crafts. You can do weapons, armor, tattoo, and he took tattooing. So I think that's cool. Maybe, uh, we can do something with, uh, finding, with the alchemy skill, rare herbs and stuff that you can make inks and maybe give bonuses to uh, attribute scores with a tattoo. Maybe I'll let every every player have one tattoo and get a bonus. Or maybe I'll let them have six tattoos for a bonus plus one to each ability score. I think that would be pretty cool. I think that would be really cool, actually. But then again, if he fails, you know, you lose the die and you got to redo it and all that other stuff. So it could be time consuming, but that would be cool to do on the side as we're doing adventures. So, but his name is Fenrin the Elf and uh, he's level one and he has a hundred gold to spend. And the, uh, <laughs> it continues 60 gold on, on the plate mail. And he bought a two handed sword and a water skin. So once again, no other supplies, no backpack, nothing like that. That's okay then. We'll uh, we'll figure it out. So also he's going to start with two spells. So I let him choose one, which is he chose Charm Person, and then I'm going to roll as I'm putting his sheet in the Fantasy Grounds. I'll go ahead and I'll roll for the second spell. So he gets to choose one, and then one is put into his spell book randomly. And that's also in the rule cyclopedia rule cyclopedia. Oh wow, I'm butchering that. All right. So that's everything with Johnny. Johnny the elf. Fenrin the elf. Next we've got Andrew. He's uh, been one of my uh, players for many years now. And he has uh, played gnomes and everything else, played clerics in other 5e games, and uh, he's playing a cleric here. He's playing Brother Claudius. And uh, Andrew had pretty decent rolls. He rolled a, a 13 strength, a 9 intelligence. Uh, he rolled an 8 wisdom, a 9 dex, and an 11 constitution, and an 8 charisma. But you can see that he chose to flip-flop wisdom and constitution. So now he gets a negative 1 uh, to his hit points every level. But he does still have uh, an 11 wisdom. Uh, he does not get an experience point bonus, and the cleric is one of the core classes that is in basic Dungeons and Dragons, and the cleric is uh, is a human. So I'll kind of go over a little bit. Uh, of course, you know, wisdom is the prime ability score and stuff, and I'm going to do more videos on on character creation and stuff. So, of course, they get spells, but. Clerics don't get spells until second level, but it's only 1,500 experience points. So he'll be level, he'll basically be halfway to level four by the time Johnny hits level two because of the elf just takes a lot more experience. And so the 
saving throws for the elf are higher because you know they're not a demi human so death rain poison is 11 so it's like three higher already than the demi humans magic wands is 12 paralysis and st turn to stone is 14 dragon breath is 16 rod staff and spell is 15 so that's that's pretty crazy the uh, definitely it gets a little bit higher for the non uh hybrid or demi human classes uh now the cleric also gets a, a couple of spell ability. Well, they, they get one. They get to turn in dead. And turn in dead is always fun in basic Dungeons and Dragons. So it goes by 7, 9, and 11. You'll notice this if you ever look at the rule cyclopedia or the basic box set. Uh, basically, at level one, he can turn he can turn a skeleton, zombie, and ghoul. Anything higher than that, white all the way to you know a, a lich or a special kind of undead, they can't they can't turn until later levels. So how it works is this: you basically turn X amount of hit dice. So if you turn, you roll two d six. If you're successful with your turn undead, you turn two d six hit dice worth of undead. Uh, so there's there's basically two rolls involved and you have to yeah basically got to make your turn check uh, at a seven then if you're successful well you get to turn 2d6 hit dice worth of uh, skeletons or zombies or ghouls and as you increase in level you can you obviously the numbers will go down so by level two you'll automatically turn uh, skeletons so you won't even have to do do the roll. You'll just go right to the X amount of hit dice roll, and that's how many you just automatically turn as you hold up your holy symbol and voila. And he does have a holy symbol. Look at that. But then again, he did have 130 gold too. So yeah, and then you can actually start destroying undead too. To where you you just start destroying X amount of of hit dice. So turn undead is going to be vital for this party later on down the line especially when you start getting into the you know the higher uh types of undead uh, so they do get to turning undead which is pretty nice and then of course they get you know clerical spells as well and they get up to seventh level spells pretty bad not not too bad so uh brother claudius as andrew is cla calling him he's uh taken the sling and the mace weapon mastery interesting i like that i like the sling and then for skills he gets four skills uh so he took healing he took danger sense we haven't talked about danger sense yet basically it, it, it's sort of like the barbarian later on with da danger sense fourth edition fifth edition stuff like that it's probably in 3.5 also but it basically, it doesn't tell you what type of danger. It's sort of like spidey senses or the hair on the back of your neck stands up. And that's something that I'm going to incorporate. So if I, if I think something is going to be dangerous for them, I'm going to say, hey, Andrew, or, or hey, Claudius, the hairs on the back of your neck are standing up and uh, you sense that there's type of, uh, a type of danger around here. He's not going to know what type of danger, but he'll know that, you know, maybe they'll be, start to be on the guard or something. Uh, so next is mysticism. And mysticism, I believe, is with like cults and rituals and stuff like that, altars, etc. And then alertness basically is he can never be surprised. So if the, you know, if I go into like a surprise role, you know, he's not surprised. And if there's, you know, and if he's on watch and if there's any slight noise, that alert skill, which I'll make him do an alert roll, or I may do it for him to kind of keep the, you know, not to take any rolls away for the from the players, but I want them to be surprised or like, hey, all of a sudden you you heard something and now you're 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 up and about and you're like hearing crunching off to the the west of the encampment or something. So alertness is definitely a good skill to have as well, and uh, I, I like the optional skill system. And then of course you can see that you know 
he had 130 gold. He he was, you know, he's the millionaire of the party. And, you know, he bought plate mail, shield. He's got 900 coins of encumbrance. He even calculated as an encumbrance for me, which I appreciate. But then again, Fantasy will fantasy Grounds will do that with the uh, core RPG rule set that we're using. He bought a sling. He bought sling bullets. Uh, he, he bought lead sling bullets, which is even better yet. He bought a, a sack, boots, clothes, Holy symbol, belt pouch, water skin, uh, torches, because he's a human and he's blind in the dark. He's got a tinder box. I'm sure he'll probably let Batilda use that, which is a good thing. He's got a long cloak. He's got seven days of iron rations. That's only going to last a day because everybody else is going to be hungry in this party. And everybody's going to be staring at Brother Claudius when he starts munching into those iron rations on the first night. And everybody's just going to be looking at him and their mouths are just going to be watering after a long day of travel. (laughs) Oh, that's too good. So that's Brother Claudius and the cleric. So that's, hey, I'm I'm happy that uh, we got a cleric in the party. It's nice. But he won't get spells until level two. But it works the same way as, you know, you can basically cast any spells that his level one deity has for him. So, And last but not least, we have Lance. Lance has been a player of mine for a couple of years now. He's Pernicious Pilfer in the Twitch chat. And he has decided to make a thief. And his name is Klutz the Thief. And I think from what he's saying, he's going to be playing him in a, a Bobcat Golwaith type of uh, <laughs> stuttering type of cleric, which will be interesting uh, to see nonetheless. And I'm, I'm excited about that. And I love it when, when players get into you know their characters and stuff. That's uh, actually really awesome. So, But he's playing a thief. And he's done a couple of things with his because you know on page seven in the rules encyclopedia you can kind of drop one score down by two and raise your primary by one and he's basically the only person in this group that could do that and he he did that but he originally rolled a 12 and he actually rolled manually so he took his webcam and he faced it down on the table and he rolled manually which i let i told all the players hey if you want to do that go for it. I thought that was actually a pretty cool idea. So I went ahead and, and let him do it. And he didn't, he, he actually, I, he rolled the best. I mean, he had the, the highest score and everything else. So he rolled a 12 strength an 11 intelligence an eight wisdom, a 14 dex, an eight con, and then an eight, uh, yeah, 15 charisma. Wow. So he could really control some, uh, henchmen, right? So what he did was he, he, uh, did a re-roll and he actually took that con from an eight and he rolled a 10. So, Hey, that was a win-win for him. So then he went ahead and lowered two ability scores. Now, when you raise a primary ability score and drop other ability scores, you cannot, you basically cannot lower, you can't lower decks. You can't lower con and you can't lower charisma. So what he did is his primary is dex, of course, for being a thief. He lowered a strength from a 12 down to a 10, as you can see. Well, actually, no, you can't because I don't have the revised copy on there. But yeah, I'll, I'll add that on anyway. So, But you can see that not only does he get a 10% experience points bonus now because he has a 16 dexterity, But he lowered his strength down to two. So he lost two ability score points just to get his dex up by two. Which now he'll get a plus two bonus to AC. And he'll also get a plus two bonus to missile attacks and missile damage. So great move. But he was the only player that had the ability scores to be able to do that. He couldn't, you can't lower charisma. So, you know, he could, he couldn't tear up the charisma score score, which, you know, if he could, I'm sure that's probably what he would have done. But if he goes into any kind of melee attack now, he's only going to have a 10. So he's not going to have a, a plus one bonus anymore. It's just going to be a normal roll because there's no finesse weapons in basic dungeons and dragons. Everything melee is based off of strength. 
<clears throat> but good job with the ability scores, really. I mean, he's he's definitely going longbow, as you can see with his uh, with his weapon mastery, and he's also going with the normal sword, which normal sword is a one d eight, which is basically equivalent to a long sword. They just don't call it a long sword in basic D and D. Now uh, he took his four skills. <clears throat> and he took blind shooting. We've already talked about that with Rob's halfling. Danger sense, we've already talked about that with Andrew's cleric. Uh, escape, we've already talked about that with Rob's halfling. And acrobatics, we've already talked about uh, acrobatics as well with Johnny's elf. So he's taken those four uh, skills. Now we rolled 70 gold. But before we do the gold, we'll kind of talk about some other stuff with the with the the rogue as well. And the rogue gets uh, some pretty cool stuff. Uh, they get a, a bunch of thieves abilities. However, I will say this, and if you've played basic Dungeons and Dragons before, you know that your thief special abilities really suck at level one, and they suck up until about level ten and. To about level 10 or so when you have at least a 50% chance. So I will, I, I will kind of tell you how, and they also get the worst saving thieves get the worst saving throws too. So uh, the thieves, but the thieves level really quick. It only takes 1200 experience points to get level two, basically 1200 experience points a level. So he's going to be basically level four by the time Johnny hits level two, basically. 1200 experience basically that's really nice so you know his, his thief skills will you know thief abilities will go up quite quite a bit but for levels one to four death rain poison is a 13 and that's the lowest saving theory has magic wands is a 14 paralysis and turn to stone is a 13 breath attack is a 16 and rods, staves, and spells are 15. So you can see the rogue gets the worst saving throws, but they're the fastest to level. <clears throat> That's why. Now for thieves special abilities, you guys are going to get a chuckle out of this. A 15% success for open locks. Only 15%. This isn't like D&D 5e where you have all these proficiencies and double proficiencies and get you know plus 8 and plus 10 at level 1 you get a 15% chance to open locks, a 10% chance, 10% chance to find traps, 10% chance to remove traps. Now here's where you're going to shine at level one as a thief. You get an 87% chance to climb walls. <laughs> Move silently is 20% chance. Hide in shadows, 10% chance. Pick pockets, 20% chance. I want to see him use that at a 20% chance. I really do. And then hear noise, which is sort of like a perception to modern day uh, D&D, is 30%. But they usually go up about 5% a level. So not only do they get uh, you know the thieves' abilities and saving throws, they also get backstabbing. So if a sneeze, if if the thief can have a successful hide in shadows and move silently and stuff, you can actually sneak up on a victim completely unnoticed and you can use backstab if you're using a one-handed weapon. And it basically hits a vulnerable part of the target's body. And when when this happens, if, if he's successful in sneaking up, he gets a plus four on the attack roll, which is really nice. And if, if it's a hit on the target, basically it's a twice normal damage which is really nice. But if he fails on the sneak, it he doesn't get to, to, to do any kind of backstab. So, yeah, it's really nice. And then he gets to read languages, which is really nice. And this is when he hits fourth level. When, when, uh, when Klutz the Thief hits fourth level, he's going to have an 80% chance to read any normal writing or languages. And that's they're going to have pretty much everything covered for the most part. But then of course, if it's a rare language or some type of codex language, then the percent, the, and then it's up to me as a dungeon master to basically give them X percentage chance of success. And finally, the thief is the only other class 
that can use magic user scrolls. So at 10th level, the thief gains the ability to cast magic user spells from spell scrolls. But there's always a 10% chance that the spell will backfire, creating an unexpected result because, you know, the thief is imperfect and, you know, maybe not know all of the magical incantations and writings. So that's pretty cool. So not only will the L, well, actually not even Johnny's going to be able to read scrolls, only Lance. So I'm sure all of the scrolls will probably go to Klutz. And Klutz, uh, finally, he rolled 70 gold. And he took uh, leather armor, longbow, of course, uh, arrows, normal sword. So he's got his weapon masteries covered. Uh, he's got torches, no backpack, and he has a 10-foot pole and a water skin. So I guess he's carrying his torches around in his 10-foot pole. So that's that's all of the characters. And, you know, and hey, I can definitely see that plate mail was the priority here for everyone. Uh, so we'll see if... Everybody wants to maybe downgrade to chain mail. And because, you know, I'm running this true D&D, except for my spell slot. You know, I've already discussed this on how I'm going to run my basic D&D games in the other video. So, you know, uh, yeah, maybe they might have to downgrade to maybe scale mail or chain mail and, and buy some more equipment. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to uh, basically uh, kind of let everybody know that. But, hey. They're going to find money. They're going to find stuff anyway. So, But, hey, starting off the bat, have your stuff ready because they don't even know where they're going. They're going to be somewhere in the Grand Duchy of Karamikos. Or maybe will they find some type of fissure in the forest. And maybe if they go through the fissure, maybe they might be somewhere else. I don't know. It depend They're going to have multiple options. That's for sure because I've got... I've over, you know, two, three months of me planning on doing this. I've put so much content, basic D and D. I have like eight complete modules ready to go. I'm like rocking on that stuff. So, but anyway, there there's character creation. It, you know, they're not overpowered. That's for sure. You know, it's not, this isn't care bear mode or anything as a couple of other people have mentioned, Oh, the way you're doing ability scores and using, you know, your homebrew weapon map in your homebrew skill check system this isn't my doing this is you know options that basic dungeons and dragons has provided over the years in different box sets and the rule cyclopedia like i said the only thing that i'm doing is starting them off at max hit points at first level which i did not mention yet and i'm also letting them use whatever spells they have instead of memorizing one cure light wound and one bless spell they can use their spell slots on whatever they want it's not game breaking. So, but this is going to be a challenge for him. It really is. And I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So let me know, guys and gals, down in the combat, down in the comment section, the combat section, let me know what you guys think of character creation. And let me know what you guys think, how they're going to fare. And what would you have done with your gold? Or what would you have done with your weapon masteries or skills? I want to know down in the comment section below. And I'll answer all. I'll answer and read everything. So thanks again, everybody. I appreciate it. And we'll be playing Basic Dungeons & Dragons next Saturday night, which is going to be June 22nd at 8 p.m. Mountain Time on my live Twitch channel. So if you want to see some basic D&D, this is the place to do it. So until Saturday night next week, happy gaming and leave some comments. Bye, everybody.